Folks, if you can take your seat, we're going to get started, please. Uh, good morning and welcome to nipponnovation.com. Check one, two, three. Good morning, folks. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Dave McClure. I'm the founder and general partner, thank you, founder and general partner of Practical Venture Capital. Uh, I was also previously founder and general partner at 500 Startups. Uh, I've been coming to Japan for about 30 years, and I'm really happy to be back again. Um, we're going to be talking about startups and venture capital, uh, a U.S. and Japan collaboration. So I hope throughout the day, uh, if things get boring, you should go outside and chat with people and then uh, get to know everybody else, but hopefully we will not be boring. Uh, I'm going to start off uh, very briefly and talk a little bit about my experiences here in Japan, and then we'll have an opening keynote by video from Russell Kummer, who is the founder uh, and chairman now of Payd.com. That company was acquired by PayPal for about 2.7 billion about a year or two ago. Actually, I'm bragging that was one of my best investments in Japan. Uh, all right, I'm going to sit down because my knees are not what they used to be. Hopefully, you won't mind. Uh, and let's see if I can get the clicker working here. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors. Uh, that includes Jetro. 42 Geeks, uh, Agility, uh, Woven Capital, Practical Venture Capital, that's us, Binos, TS2, and I apologize if I'm not sure about all of the other names of our sponsors there, but they're all amazing and wonderful, and I hope to be drinking with you tonight. Uh, we're going to have uh, four main sessions today with breaks in between, so we'll have about three talks this morning and then a break, and then another few talks. Uh, we'll have a lunch break, and then we'll have a few afternoon sessions as well with a break in between. Uh, I'm going to start off with a little bit about me and my love affair with Japan. So Nippon Novation, uh, again, I hope the uh, name of the conference is not too hokey, uh, but we tried to come up with something that would actually combine innovation and Japan and also U.S. So that's a picture that sort of morphs together. Uh, Mount Fuji and the Golden Gate Bridge. I don't know if you guys got that or not. <laughs> oh, sugoi. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about 42 Geeks. Uh, Chuck Oi, my partner in crime. Uh, where are you? Right there. Uh, so we have brought with us about 40, actually a little bit more than 42 Geeks from New York, Silicon Valley, and all over the world. Uh, this is our third country on our trip. Uh, we have been through Taiwan and Korea and now to Japan. Uh, we started doing 42 Geeks uh, last year, and this is our fourth trip around the world. But actually, some of you may know I had previously been doing Geeks on a Plane for over 13 years. And our first, very first uh, Geeks on a Plane trip back in 2009 or 10, I think, uh, was also coming here to Japan. That's a picture of a bunch of Geeks in a lobby of a hotel in Taipei. Uh, so this is a very thin font, but just a few notes about my uh, love affair with Japan. So I've pretty much been a fan of Japan since I started watching Speed Racer. I was probably about seven years old. Uh, that was back in the 70s. I was also a big fan of uh, anime and animation. Uh, when Akira came out, I think in 88, I saw it in 89. Uh, and I pretty much watched every Hayao Miyazaki film uh, ever made, at least I think so. Uh, I first visited Japan in 1994, and I've made over 50 trips in the last 30 years. Uh, I married a Japanese jazz pianist. Uh, you might have been hearing some music that was playing. That was actually my wife, uh, Saya, and she uh, got to play. She came to the U.S. and uh, was studying music in New Orleans with, the, um, with Ellis Marsalis. Some of you know who that is. And she got to play with the backup keyboards for the Neville Brothers for a few years. Uh, she then came here to Japan and had a label deal with Pony Canyon between 2001 and 2006. I made my first VC investments in Japan in 2010. Uh, Matt Romaine was one of the co-founders of Gengo, which was acquired, uh, and Payti, which I just mentioned before. We'll hear from Russell in just a second. Uh, 
Uh, we also raised capital from a number of Japanese LPs uh, and folks who helped with that, uh, Joey Ito, George Kellerman, uh, Shuji Honjo, and Ryota Matsuzaki. But we raised money from uh, over at least 10, probably 10 or more Japanese LPs. We started a fund, 500 Startups in Japan, here in 2016. That was run by James Riney and Yohei Sawayama. They're now running Coral Capital. Uh, and we invested in over 60 companies uh, in Japan. I'm also an LP in a Japanese VC fund. Shizen Capital is Matt Romain's new VC fund. I have two other Japanese American startups which are very important to me. That's my son and daughter. Uh, Dante just started college this year. Uh, he's in Berlin for a few months before going to Boston to attend Northeastern. And my daughter Layla is a junior in high school. Uh, I'm such a believer in Japan that I brought, bought property here twice. Uh, once in 2020 and again just this year uh, and we decided to bring this conference here to Japan to really uh, open up Japan for some of our folks from the US who may not know about all the opportunities here but we'll we'll hear more about that opportunity throughout the day uh, and now the big plug that is my most precious startup or one of the two uh, that's a picture of my son from probably 17 years ago I'm guessing I actually had some hair then and that's my wife Saya uh, Layla was not born yet, but she'll be featured later. Um, I bring up this picture just because we'll be hearing from Mark Suster later today, and he came with us on one of our very first Geeks on a Plane trips, uh, again, I think about 12 or 13 years ago. Uh, sorry for the grainy photograph. That's him on the left. Uh, you might recognize the lady to my left in that photo to your right. Uh, my partner, Amon Vergy, is a big fan of Hillary Clinton, I hear. I did not have shoes on. I had flip-flops on. I cut them out of the picture. But I, I don't dress up for foreign dignitaries or even uh, domestic dignitaries, I guess. Uh, all right, so we're going to jump into a little bit of a, a talk about Patey. Uh, and Russell would have been here himself. However, uh, he's currently supposed to be having a surprise birthday party in Dubai that his wife is throwing for him. Uh, I don't think it's a surprise anymore because he had to... He had to tell me about that in order to not show up. Um, but we have a, a short video clip here that we'll play and hear a little bit from him. Good morning. This is Dave McClure with Practical Venture Capital. Uh, you'll be seeing this here in Tokyo on the morning of October 12th. Uh, we're here at our Nippon Innovation Conference. Uh, that's a conference on U.S., Japan, uh, venture capital, and startups. And I have with me our guest speaker and featured speaker, Russell Kummer, who is the uh, founder and CEO, now chairman of Payday. Uh, Payday is a payments company that was acquired by PayPal, uh, I believe, uh, a year or two ago for about $2.7 billion. Uh, one of the largest, I think maybe the largest M&A transaction in Japan ever. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be an early investor in the company. Um, Russell, unfortunately, uh, I guess, or fortunately, couldn't join us because he's about to have a birthday party, a uh, surprise birthday party, maybe not surprise anymore. Anymore. Thrown by his wife in Dubai, uh, but he's been kind enough to uh, help us record a little bit of an interview that we'll be playing back uh, in Tokyo. Uh, Russell, welcome. Yeah, thank you, Dave. And as I say, hi everybody. I'm I'm sorry not to be there, but I'm very excited that uh, everyone is uh, is learning more about the startup ecosystem in Japan. And I hope you guys have a great concert conference. And uh, yeah, apologies from my wife. I was planning to come, and I she put her foot down and said, "You idiot! There are eight friends coming from Tokyo out here to have a surprise birthday party for you, so you can't." <laughs> go. So I'm very sorry, but welcome and thank you for having me, Dave. And, and you know, I hope you guys will have a great event. So thank you. Awesome. Sorry for spoiling your surprise birthday party. Um, we'll try and keep this short. So I'd love to hear a little bit about the beginnings of Payday and how you came to Japan. Uh, maybe a little bit about the acquisition and or your decision, you know, not to go to an IPO uh, and where things are at now. And then maybe some reflections on, you know, the Japan startup opportunity, uh, you know, today versus maybe a decade ago. Uh, how did yeah. you decide to come to Japan and why Why did you decide to start Payday? Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, so I, I actually have spent most of my life in Asia and, and now Japan is actually the place where I live the longest. So I was born in Singapore and I grew up in Hong Kong. Um, 
And actually, I started working after graduate school for Goldman Sachs in Japan. And I, I, I think maybe there's something that will resonate with some of the entrepreneurs in their audience. I, I mean, I really like that. And I like working with Goldman, lots of respect for the firm. And they ended up being an investor in Baby and, and sort of helpful later on. But I also kind of knew that I really wanted to, to go out and try and do my own thing. Uh, that, uh, that that was going to be important for me on, on my kind of life journey. I wasn't sure if it would work or not, but I, I knew that I really kind of wanted to make a stab at it. Um, and I had this observation at, at Goldman that basically financial services, you know, were evolving in Japan, that actually it was a big market that you wanted to be able to serve. Um, and that actually, unlike when I was in California, where it seemed like, you know, every good idea had sort of 10 well-funded teams going after them, in the Japanese context, it felt like only one out of 10 opportunities had anybody trying to do anything. And of course, when you say this was a long time ago, you know, our shared joke is, you know, Katie is an overnight success that only took 13 years. <laughs> um, but I, 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 you know, I left, I left the firm and I, I got first into the money lending business in Japan. We were originally a peer to peer lending business and we learned a lot. And I, I think honestly, a big you part of that is we unique learned how there. I, I think I remember that you got uh, a money license, uh, in Japan, which was very, yeah. unusual, particularly for uh, a foreigner. Foreigners, yes, that's right. Yeah, look, I, I think Japan is a great place to build a business, right? It's, uh, you know, there's real rule of law. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, you, there's no kind of idea of being better or worse connected. You know, everything is at your disposal. So yes, we were able to go out and get licensed. We were unique in that we were in a regulated space and, you know, a, a team that was born. And this, again, was almost maybe 13 or 15 years ago now. Um, but that, that was our experience. And then look, we, we did that business. We learned a lot about regulation, about risk, but we also learned about building consumer experiences. And actually the consumer experience of borrowing from us as a peer to peer lender wasn't differentiated enough to really scale. So as a team, again, as an entrepreneur, we, we kind of reduced the team. You know, at one point we had maybe a dozen people. We fired everybody down to four. We were very lucky. We had investors like you and other people that kind of supported us through that pivot. And then, and then we took all that we had learned and repurposed it into KD, which everybody now knows that, you know, VNPL as a, as a kind of category exists. Um, and then we grew that into, you know, kind of the largest VNPL service in Japan. We partnered with Apple, Amazon, basically kind of you, you name it in terms of international e-commerce guys and tons of local uh local you know, brands um and then of course it was purchased by by paypal as you say in the largest venture m a transaction i'm sure there are much bigger venture m a but um and look for, for me you know that journey was really interesting there were the learnings about how you as a founder have to grow you know the business to some extent will be capped by whatever current state you're at and i was very different as a 28 year old founder leaving goldman to start the company and being a you know forty year old founder selling it to a publicly listed company, and and honestly the, the growth through that that dozen years with tremendous support from investors, from partners, from employees, you know like that growth opportunity, I'm also extremely grateful for, and I can see how at each stage of that journey, you know, I replaced myself as the sole CEO. I, I hired a great partner, Fuku Sudie. Uh, and he and I still kind of run the business together, but that was graduation. You know, my co-founder, who was great at the beginning, he replaced himself as CTO. That was also very helpful because then when we were being acquired by a large public company, we had a CTO that could do that interface very well. So, you know, that journey was really special. And I think Japan is a great place to do it. You know, the, the first the first four people at the, at the company, the first two employees are still there. You know, we, we've been on that whole journey together. I think that's very Japanese, right? People commit, they, you know, it's, it, there is this cliche that it's hard to get people to join a startup. I think that that's falling away more and more. There are so many successes now in Macari and a bunch of others that, that people are excited to go on that journey. But I'll always be grateful to Japan for those opportunities and, and not only for kind of, you know, the, the kind of the career aspect, but even this kind of personal growth around this journey of building a business and, and seeing it continue to grow. I don't know if that answers the question, but anyway. That, that's great. I, I know we're skipping over a ton of time and a lot of ups and downs and journeys in the business, but yeah. after you sort of went to the buy now, pay later model, after you sort of had the relationships with Apple and Amazon, those I'm sure helped 
scale the company to a large you know uh, size um I, I know at one point you were thinking about maybe going public and you know you decided to take an exit uh, through acquisition I, I guess i would say a very yeah. timely exit um probably yeah. um could you maybe talk a little bit about why you chose that route and what was going through yeah. your mind and sort of considering yeah. those those exit opportunities yeah so i think um yeah as a late state like so there's all these aspects of being founded right you have to you know be the keeper of the vision you have to you know build the team and drive everybody you know with that shared vision you have to make sure you don't run out of money and die uh but actually it's it's a little different later on which is kind of okay well there are sometimes there is this aspect where you're being true to the vision of what you build and how you service you know customers and partners and whatever that actually sometimes there's just a really natural home for the asset and somehow like i, I feel again i i don't want to i don't want to speak in stereotypes but there is this kind of stereotype that in a japanese context founders are become obsessed with going public or founders go public too early you know there's and, and and i think again those narratives are changing a little bit there's a tremendous amount of capital available people can try and scale businesses more before they list them but you know the listing becomes kind of a goal in and of itself and that wasn't really the case for us right capital structure was kind of subordinate to really this kind of mission and what was the right you know what was the right place to go and continue to execute and, but and in our it space was certainly large enough yeah. that you could have gone ipo oh, we, we, particularly I mean, even for the Japanese, we were, yeah. I mean, without without overshare. I mean, we were we like we we ran a, a dual track process, which is kind of more custom in the well, elsewhere. But again, for all kinds of interesting reasons, it probably behooves founders to think about it that way, right? You're you're supposed to create optionality, you know, all of that other good stuff. And for us, it was just very clear. PayPal is a very natural home. As you may recall, around exactly the same time, Afterpay was purchased by Square, which then became Block. So there was this kind of idea that, okay, you know, um, access to larger balance sheet, although in a Japanese context, we had very good access to capital for, for running the business. But basically being part of a larger platform that could allow you to have relationships that are deeper with global you know, merchants, the, the, whatever, the Shopify is, et cetera, of the world. I think that rationale was there, very complimentary fit in that Katie is a is a very powerful domestic brand. I I would say that I would I'd like <laughs> to think that, but obviously we we continue to grow that grow that brand, um, and hopefully the members of the audience will will recognize Katie. Um, so for for me again on this kind of personal uh, you know founder's journey, um, actually I kind of understood that I was less you know there was there wasn't this intrinsic drive to be a oh i made it to ipo founder for my own motivation it wasn't a motivating factor in any way so well, then we could really look at it as like what what is the right outcome for investors for the team for the business and, and really like that for the asset going forward so yeah and i i think given the other transaction that was happening with with square it seemed like there was activity in the market where there was an opportunity that presented itself and you know yeah, maybe exactly. that was a good time uh yeah you know a lot of entrepreneurs don't take advantage of the right market timing it seems like you guys yeah. did yeah well I, I i joke but it's true it's always better to be lucky than good <laughs> you know so so we were lucky yeah yeah it's kind of interesting but that said look I, I i think we built a really robust business that honestly has continued to grow tremendously post acquisition leveraging all of, of what we wanted to get from having a bigger balance sheet and having a parent you know the single shareholder structure is very different than having to balance maybe different priorities amongst the more diverse uh you know group of shareholders so yeah, we're we're very pleased, and I'm, I'm very pleased that you were you were part of that journey, uh, Dave. You, you, you know. I, I believe and the other thing, yeah. brag comment I'm supposed to say here was glad to be a small part of your big. Well, journey. there, well, but, <laughs> but it is you know to everybody, and like it is a journey, and people should embrace it. Like I think that I I want to be the one founder that kind of speaks founder. You know, like this, you're gonna you're gonna grow okay. from this. You're gonna let's, be challenged. Let's all of it. put yeah. the put a pin in that for a second. Now, let's talk maybe about you know your perspectives on the current Japanese market yeah. opportunity for startups and how is yeah. that different, better, worse today uh, than maybe yeah. 10, 13, 15 years ago? 
And yeah. do, you, do you think it's a good opportunity for startups in Japan today? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. I absolutely do. So I think the answer to this can be very succinct. Look, uh, 15 years ago, not very much uh, 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 sort of high quality investor base, which I do think has gotten much better. And I think there is a view globally, not just for Japan, but for a bunch of different geographies where, you know, I think um, uh, if you are starting a business in Japan and it's fairly well understood, then basically the like country risk of Japan, I think everybody views it as a very safe jurisdiction. You can't have accidents, you can't have listings, you can't, you know, all of this, that, and the other. Regulation is good, all of that stuff. Uh, you know, if it's a business model that's kind of been de risked or proven elsewhere, so let's say BNPL or, you know, whatever, P2B, uh, uh, you know, person to person shopping, like the carousels or the McFries or whatever, that's okay. Then all that's left is really this like execution risk around the team. Are they going to manage it well? Are they going to do the right things? All of that's it's very important. Sorry, somebody was cleaning something with me here. I hope it's not too loud. Um, so I, I think that, that there are more and more people, you know, the story of Haiti was basically funding onshore, funding offshore, funding onshore, funding offshore. You know, we raised more than $300 million, um, through, uh, A to D. Uh, and it, it almost it sort of was really this back and forth. And, and the offshore people, there are people that are very expert at, let's say, fintech or ad tech or insure tech or biotech. And actually, those people are not limiting themselves. You know, this old, this old paradigm of, okay, if it's, if you're not, you know, 10 minutes from Sandhill Road, I don't think that's true anymore. And I think that good teams executing on good strategies in Japan really can take advantage of that. I think there are people that are looking to do that, right? I mean, again, there's various different, um, you know, obviously there's your conference, there's all sorts of different people that are, um, you know, that are looking at Japan. And I think the talent base there is good. And really this talent on the investor side, I, I, I don't want to praise investors too much, but, you know, in my journey, like having access to people that have been early investors in comparable businesses and could give guidance about how you scale, let's say, a balance sheet or a book of risk or even other things, whatever, like branding, partner, like that was very, very helpful. And I, I think that that is available to Japanese founders now if if they're able to take advantage of it, which is great. That's good for the ecosystem. It's good for everybody. Well, I, I, I appreciate you kind of giving us some time uh, away from your birthday party. Um, I, I know we're going to be hearing a lot of stories today about different uh, programs and initiatives that are being put on by the Japanese government, uh, both for investors and for entrepreneurs, and, and also for foreign investors uh, in Japan as well, which I know is a big part of the push and hopefully of interest to some of our attendees here today. Um, Russell, thanks for uh, making time for yeah. us. And, My uh, pleasure. Congrats. All right. Congrats again yeah, on a great, so much. Uh, a great outcome, and uh, I oh, hope that uh, hope you'll put some of that money back into uh, Japanese startups and maybe other well, funds we, that are in there too. We, we do our best. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, everybody. Good luck, and uh, and uh, thanks again for having me. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Um, Sorry, the audio, call, audio quality wasn't uh, amazing there, but uh, hopefully we got a little bit of the flavor. Uh, one thing I did want to point out, I know we're highlighting a Gaijin's business who was successful in Japan. I, I did that because I kind of feel like that's harder. And actually, there's plenty of other examples of domestic Japan entrepreneurs being quite successful. Uh, Mikitani-san uh, at Rakuten, uh, Taizo uh taizo will be with us later today taizo son and his brother masuyoshi son at softbank um but i think it's particularly interesting that you know a company that was started by a foreigner also had a big outcome and actually me as a gaijin investor in japan had a pretty much 100x outcome on our investment there uh so it's not impossible for other people to access the Japanese market. It's the third largest economy in the world. Uh, I would actually say there's less competition here than maybe other places in the world. And the opportunity is still tremendous, uh, both as an entrepreneur and an investor in Japan. Um, we're going to move on to our next speaker and hear from Mark Suster. Uh, Mark is a good friend of mine uh, from